I want to get into another mo uh, another uh, perception topic called motion perception and this is obviously very important for virtual reality. Um, you can of course look at static panoramas in virtual reality, but our perception of motion is really fundamental to the kinds of things that we um, that we do all over the place in virtual reality. So, that is the next uh, big topic motion perception and remember as I said last time it is kind of a template you know there is x perception where x may be all sorts of things uh, depth, scale, motion, color um, on and on and on. So, so um, we may also apply the same concept to uh, hearing or touch. So, um, perception of different kinds of textures for example. So, this is um, again as we go through these pathways from the sense organ all the way up to the higher parts of the brain there is some hierarchical processing going on and there is a perceptual process in there and that is what we are trying to get an understanding of and trying to characterize. So, what are the purposes for motion perception? Some of the main purposes well one of them is uh, segmentation or segregation in other words um, we might like to know if we are looking at a scene in the um, in the jungle let us say we might like to know that um, there is an animal that is moving there right. So, so the perception of that motion is very important and you might imagine um, for evolutionary reasons it is very important right to know if there is something moving in the jungle right or in the forest that is a that is about to I do not know potentially eat you let us say right. So, um, so it is very important to identify that. So, perceiving that motion among a static background is very important and you might notice that our eyes tend to fixate very quickly on something that is moving. In modern times our ability to detect a moving car or, or 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 cycle or some other some other vehicle that may be a, a dangerous to us as we cross the road is also important right. So, it has a similar kind of purpose. So, we are very good at um, extracting some object that is moving from a background that is stationary. Um, another purpose is to extract 3D structure. 3D structure of an object um, from the motion. So, for example, um, you know if I if I see this book moving around in some way I get some idea about its structure this book does not have a very complex structure, but um, take something you know much more complicated like a chair with legs and such move it around and you get an idea of its structure just from the way it is moving around on your retina right. There is some two dimensional image that is changing on your retina, but you can infer three dimensional structure you can learn a lot about that. It is almost as good as if you walked up and started probing the object with your arms and use all of that information to try to build a 3D picture. So, we are very good at building 3D pictures somehow in our minds of objects that we have not um, maybe ever seen exactly before, but we are using a lot of prior information again prior bias and and from the context we have a lot of information about how the lights falling on it in a certain setting that we are familiar with and we make judgments about its three dimensional shape. You can make illusions and fool the brain in some in some cases and get some false conclusions, but nevertheless we rely on this very carefully um, very frequently in, in in a large number of settings. And finally another um, key purpose is visual guidance of action. And this is exactly part of where I wrote on scale perception here one of the one of the important aspects reaching out and grabbing something. So, if we want to reach out and grab something then we are using um, motion and we are using um, motion perception we are perceiving the motion of our hand as we reach and grab something and that visual feedback helps us to accomplish the task. So, visual guidance of our actions. So, that is useful for manipulation like grab a cup. Um, general hand eye coordination and um, <coughs> may provide information about um, you know other kinds of self motion. Questions about that? I am going to cover a couple more topics and then I want to get to one of the main aspects of this perception of motion which is going to be frames per second I really would like to talk about that because that is obviously something that is on our brains a lot we talk about this in connection to the lab the virtual reality lab and um, we would like to know how many frames a second are enough, but I want to give a few more basic concepts first. So, one thing that I find fascinating is if we look at the neural circuitry 
remember we talked about the visual pathways from photoreceptors all the way up to the visual cortex. So, along that path and actually very early in the path we have the following kind of circuitry. So, suppose there is an object that is going to go moving across the retina, there is some object it goes moving across the retina and imagine that there are neural detectors let us say. So, somewhere back here there is a detector A and a detector B. So, imagine this neuron fires whenever the object moves across this location and as the object moves across the location here um this one fires. So, which one is going to fire first? Well, first A fires then B fires. What is interesting is there is extra neural circuitry that looks like the following it goes through here there is a box that I am going to describe in a minute and then these feed together to some third neural structure called let us say C and inside of this box is a delay say some delta T perhaps it is uh, 50 milliseconds. So, what happens here is this C fires if both A and B fire, but only if A fired a little bit ago. So, A fires a little while ago and B is firing right now the superposition of those in time right A a little while ago and then B right now will fire C. So, that is a very very simple motion detector. So, we have those all over the place for varying speeds and various um distances um uh, neighboring distances. And so, um one interesting outcome of that is that um you are able to fool this sense by something called the wagon wheel effect. which if you have ever um made some kind of pattern like the following let us see you take a you put some stripes around the rim of a wheel and then you spin the wheel it may start to look like it is rotating backwards even though it is going forward. So, this is interfering with the basic operation of this neural circuitry it is easy to fool it into thinking that it is going in the opposite direction because it is just based on very simple timings and the flashings of neighboring um I would say the, the, the kind of in some sense the flashing or or um signal appearing in various spots along your retina and those photoreceptors responding. So, um so, you can very easily fool it into thinking reverse directions unless there is a more coherent picture of moving from place to place to place to place along a, a very long sequence. Um, so, this is very interesting I think. <coughs> Also, one thing to think about is object motion versus observer motion. This is one of the key ingredients to um avoiding simulator sickness if you are not careful. So, if I just were to look at the images if I could somehow make a recording of the images that hit your um array of photoreceptors right and we imagine we are just going to play a video back now of what is hitting your photoreceptors. I might see some kind of motion occurring there, but how do I know if that motion is due to you moving or some object in the scene moving could be some combination of the two, but let us suppose it is one or the other. How would I distinguish between the two if I were just watching the video I do not think there is any way to fully distinguish that right unless there is well ok maybe you would start to guess from the context what is probably happening and use your powerful brains to make an inference. But if you just look at the raw data there may not be enough there to really make the judgment. Let me um give a simple example let us suppose um <clears throat> we have an eye looking upward all right. So, I draw the cornea sticking out here and I have an object that moves from right to left. So, it is moving along like this. So, if I draw out the retina of the eye I guess when the object is over here on the right then there is an image of it over here on this part of the retina and then when it moves across it ends up over on this part of the retina not drawing too careful of a diagram here, but I think you will understand the the principle getting really curvy here. So, as the object moves from right to left imagine the eye is held fixed and then the image goes from left to right make sense. 
All right, so that is one possibility. This is um, the object moves. and the observer and I are fixed All right, So, the observer's head and the eye let us see are fixed and then there is another case <coughs> which I in which I will hold the object in one place and then I have an eye here and I move the eye over here. So, when I start off on this side can I have the retina coming around draw it again over here should be the same eye just moving across from left to right and when I start off over here I get the image on this side and when I come over to this side I get the image on the other side okay, I'm way off there let us see. Um, All right. So, in this case the eye moves and the objects fixed So, these two cases I just want to say if you imagine how the image looks along the retina they should more or less correspond to the same thing. Now, one thing I have done here I, I should admit is this is a bit fictitious of a scenario because it is actually very hard to do this in practice. So, if I um if I want to um you know try to look at an object let us say um that is moving across my field of view um it is very hard to prevent your eyes from tracking it and doing smooth pursuit. It is very hard for you to disable your vestibulo ocular reflex if you are moving around while you are fixated on something. So, in fact, if I go back and forth like this I am looking at the camera right now it is very hard for me to keep from continuing to look at the camera it is like I have to put my fingers on the sides of my eyes like this and then I can keep it from rotating that is about the only thing I can do um do not try that at home I guess maybe that is hazardous to your health um but um, um so, it is very hard to stop these reflexes. So, given that that is the case given that your eyes are going to be rotating anyway that is going to make these two cases even look very similar to the case of no movement at all right because your eyes rotating to keep a stable image on the retina. So, I just want to point out all these cases like even if your eyes are not rotating these two are somewhat indistinguishable. However, when your eyes do rotate in one case um if you are doing this this will invoke the vestibulo ocular reflex because you are moving your head back and forth um you could also do it with pure rotation which is also translating your eyes through space and then this corresponds to smooth pursuit if this object is moving slowly enough. So, those are different modes of operation which is part of the key of how the brain is going to distinguish between these. So, let me give you how the brain distinguishes between these cases let me just list out the information that is being used it is not just looking at a raw video signal let us say from the um from the array of photoreceptors it has got more sources of information coming together. So, the brain uses more information to distinguish We talked last time during saccade motions there is saccadic masking or suppression which um when this happens it suppresses the motion detectors. So, while we are performing saccades it is that the, the the motion detectors that I just um I just erased one of them right that when I did the A B and C um neural circuit those outputs are suppressed. So, already it is not going to be feeding motion detection information to your brain if your brain knows that you are performing saccades. So, very interesting so, there is already some inhibiting that occurs there um another thing that the brain uses is eye movement commands.
So, that is very interesting the the um somewhere there is a command issued to um let us say commands issued to um to contract or expand the muscles that move your eyes and rotate them right. So, um if that is the case it is a matter of sending those signals to the right place where perception is being performed where the motion perception is being performed and using that information. This is sometimes called um by neuroscientists efferents copies right the motion commands or motor commands. It is very powerful information right the same thing happens in engineering if I give a command to a robot that says move forward and then I observe what the robot is doing you, you, you can make a lot better inference if you have access to the command oh I know that the robot was commanded to go forward right. If you program the robot yourself you have that information if you did not program the robot and you do not know what is inside of it then you do not have that information right. So, so this is extra information that is inside the brain throughout our neural system let us say and uh, it can be used here. And then finally one more piece of information is large scale motion. So, if the entire scene is moving what is usually the case? Is it usually the case that everything around us is moving simultaneously or is it usually the case that in that in, in that in that event it usually means that we are moving right. So, if I if I all of a sudden notice a huge change I go like this right um it is very unlikely that all of you are rotating in in some kind of role right. So, so that is prior information if there is enormous large scale motion across the retina probably you are the one that is moving and right? so that is um falling back on it. You might remember I talked about the big swing illusion where um in an amusement park over a 100 years ago um there was a bunch of participants sat down in a swing that was actually stationary and then the entire room started rocking that is such an unusual scenario that would correspond to you know it corresponds to in reality everything is moving around you, but your brain interprets that as I must be moving and everything else is stationary and that is what made people very sick and quickly believing that the chair that, that these chairs that they are in is spinning all the way around that the swing goes all the way around 360 degrees because it was tricking this information basically um giving you um an artificial scenario where the large scale motion assumption is in fact incorrect. Yes, sir. Yeah. What cases there is saccadic masking scene even when we are moving on the object is moving. Um let us see if we are Um, saccadic masking occurring. So, let us see if 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 we are holding stationary and we are we are looking at an object well let us make let us define the scenario first. So, is it is it let us suppose there is a stationary object and we are looking around at the object right like like reading a book for example um in that case there is a lot of change across the retina, but the motion detection is suppressed right. There is another scenario where let us say the object is moving slowly in that case there is no saccade it is smooth pursuit. There is a scenario where there is the objects moving very fast and some additional saccades are being inserted in order to keep up, but I think at that point there is already been enough motion detected I believe from the smooth pursuit times in between the saccades. I am no expert on neuroscience, but I am trying to speculate as best as possible for those those different scenarios. Yeah, but still how is it different from the book is moving and you are moving the other way. Hmm. The both cases are identical in the except the large scale motion. Um no I, I think the um I think the saccade motions we do most often the saccade motions that we are doing kind of the normal saccade mode is to point the fovea or orient the fovea. So, that it is um so that you are getting higher acuity images of of a single fixed target. So, those particular motions are interpreted because of the saccadic masking as that must be motion of the eye just in that mode All right. So, in the case of smooth pursuit it is usually not the case that you are doing extra saccades to try to take in all the information of the object by pointing the fovea while it is also moving. It usually in the case of smooth pursuit is trying to keep a stable image on the retina. So, it so is not a saccade case. And this mystic person is involved in this. Um, that, that can uh, also be an information. That is a very good question yeah I think that is I think that is reasonable um why not add the vestibular sense here I, I think that is reasonable very good um yeah absolutely if 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 the head is moving there is going to be additional vestibular information if the head is fixed then it uses eye movement commands. So, I like that very much yeah. So, um vestibular uh input if head moves
or I guess your entire body could be moving without your head moving if you're on some kind of moving cart let's say in a car for example um, then the, the head itself but still technically moving with respect to the world frame but um, may not move with respect to your collarbone for example so um, all right very good any other questions or comments. Smooth pursuit and one was the vestibular ocular. Yes. The result is kind of like the same, right? Or is there some pregnancy difference? Um, smooth pursuit versus vestibular ocular. Um, well, vestibular ocular is using your vestibular signal, yeah. which I guess that's where it got used for, for one of the cases, right? So um, it's, it's using exactly your self motion in order to compensate. The smooth pursuit case is not your motion, it's the motion of the object you're trying to see, right? And so, it is based purely on uh, expectation of the motion of the object and trying to keep that stable across your retina right. Both are trying to do some kind of let us say stable image on your retina right. These are fundamental differences in whether or not the vestibular signal is getting used and evoked because of the motion or you are just trying to track a moving target and that is where the differences are. I am just trying to say that kind of geometrically in terms of just raw images these look identical, but there is so much more information going uh, being obtained by the brain that it can distinguish these two cases. That is what I want you to think yes that is right like wow it does not have you know if ju just from images. So, if we were to think like engineers and we just turn on a video signal and look at it and go how does the brain know right. So, I am saying yes the brain knows there is a lot more information here. So. All right very good and these are very good comments very good ways to think about things. Um, there is one more piece of uh, one more piece of information that is um, very naturally extracted from the images that change across your retina and this is called optical flow and this is this ends up being very important and um it is one of the most important aspects in relation to motion sickness or simulator simulator sickness I should say not necessarily motion sickness because the VR participant is not necessarily the one moving all right. Usually we say motion sickness for um something you might get from moving in a vehicle let us say moving in a car while being a passenger especially that is motion sickness. Simulator sickness would refer to what you get from a virtual reality experience um, for example, where you may perceive your own motion, but you are actually not moving. So, those two are kind of inverses motion sickness versus simulator sickness. Um, so, optical flow So, what happens is in this case the brain can keep track of images on the retina or features let us say on the retina. Um, so, there may be some particular feature I see a red dot above the camera there. So, I can I can move around in some way and that dot is going to appear somewhere on the retina and I can keep track of that right. And if there are several dots then if I get closer to them the dots will start spreading apart. If I go further away they will start contracting if I go to, to the left they will move to the right. So, this is called optical flow information where features are moving in the image. So, our brain perceives them to be the exact same um, object or element in the world there are a bunch of them and we perceive a kind of general flow because of that. <coughs> so, it is tracking movement of features on the retina. And we end up with a kind of um, vector field, kind of velocity field on the image plane. Or roughly the image sphere if you think about the way the retina is shaped, um, it is fine. So, if we think about various uh, self motions. as I just illustrated if I am going forward then the flows tend to be outward from the center. Correct also the flows tend to be faster at the periphery than in than straight in front of me. So, not only are there directions in the optical flow, but there is also a uh, a magnitude right. So, these are these are full full fledged velocities in the image plane or image sphere if you like to view it that way. Uh, if we go backward then these reverse 
And if we go to the left, then we see flow to the right. So, so when I move myself to the left, I see you flowing to the right. Also, if I turn myself counterclockwise, I also see flowing to the right. So, I see also uh, counterclockwise. Of course, I will get flow in the opposite direction by going right or clockwise rotation. Our ability to perceive optical flow turns out to be strongest as I look forward right about here. Um, I think somewhere around 20 to 30 degrees off. Um, this is the place where you have a very high density of rods if you remember when we looked at photoreceptor density and generally it is very strong in the periphery right. So, that means that if there is some kind of motion in the periphery we respond very quickly to that turn our heads could be a predator right maybe some evolutionary reasons for that. So, just generally speaking it is stronger in the periphery I believe it peaks around 30 degrees or so and then it starts trailing off again because of the low density of um photoreceptors that we have as we gradually go to the side gradually look to the side. Um, so, based on this optical flow we have a big problem in virtual reality a big problem you have experienced it in the lab already I am sure which is the illusion of self motion. from optical flow. This is called vection I have said this before um if you are sitting stationary in a train and the train next to you starts moving you are looking out the window maybe you are not even paying a lot of attention in fact it is your peripheral vision that notices that that there is some motion to the side you get a feeling like you are going backwards all of a sudden right. So, it is the illusion of self motion when you grab onto a controller or you hit the right keys on the keyboard and you move your avatar around in virtual reality you perceive an optical flow that gives you the illusion of self motion. Every time you do that that is a mismatch between your vestibular signals which can measure the true acceleration and your eyes which are trying to also measure the acceleration and your eyes are being fooled, but your vestibular organ is not that mismatch causes a significant amount of nausea in people and in fact, it is very easy to make horribly nauseating experiences. I believe one of the worst things you can do is to um make it appear that you are virtually rotating and then put some kind of sinusoidal oscillation into it at about a couple of hertz and people will get sick very fast like that. You want to have a fun uh, project to do in the lab try try to make the most sickening experience you can it should be some kind of rotational thing experiment with different rates and uh you know uh, compete with your friends for the for the prize of the most sickening experience. Um so, that is the problem is that the uh, the vision system and vestibular system are in conflict. Again I talked about decision theory your brain is trying to fuse information from multiple sources normally in the real world there is a there is a consistent picture now there is a big inconsistency. So, um being nauseated is not necessarily a surprising response to that right because maybe another thing consistent with that is you have been poisoned right. So, so it is good to eject right who knows. So, so, so it is hard to know exactly what the what all the mechanisms are and why this is happening, but it may be that you get sickness because um you, you the the body believes that something bad has been ingested right and and so why else would there be such a strange conflict it would not be able to take into account um modern engineering as one of the plausible hypotheses unless you experience enough of this and then eventually you may be able to train yourself to overcome this mismatch but that may be a lot of work to overcome some people may learn it easily some may not um could be could depend heavily on age gender many other kinds of factors. Um I should give one simple example of this we did some experiments um I think it is worth considering just to to try to alleviate these kinds of problems this is more in this is more has more to do with um user interface design or or avatar control or movement things like that, but I just want to give you a very simple example of this problem and how it tends to behave. So, um so very simple 
example is suppose you want to ramp up your avatar or character motion. In other words, suppose you believe you are in a virtual world right in this beautiful world you would like to move forward you grab onto a controller and you want to just start walking forward. I want to ask you which of the following two are, are best to do. So, you would like to get up to some fixed walking speed and so, this is your speed here this is time and so, one scenario is I um, mean you would like to get up to this speed let us say. So, one scenario is um, you just gradually ramp up and then get to your speed that you would like to be at and then the other choice is you just decide that you are going to rather than make a continuous change you just discontinuously jump to the speed you would like to be at and go forward. So, this one corresponds not at all to the real world because normally you cannot accelerate at an infinite rate right. So, so, but this is what you could do. So, you just pulse and all of a sudden bam you are you are walking at full speed. Which one of these is a more comfortable experience for virtual reality? Let us call this scenario A, scenario B. Um, who thinks scenario A would be more comfortable right. So, this corresponds very closely to the real world you gradually ramp up your speed is this more comfortable. Um, scenario B is this more comfortable ok I have seen I think 0 hands being raised, but some little head nods here and there. Um, so, here is what happens <coughs> what is that B I am hearing more B's now right. Right. I, I should mean you know professors are always trying to trick you right. So, it cannot be the you know th this looks like the obvious uh, kind of comfortable sort of answer just make it maybe like it real would be in the real world I start off and I just gradually get up to a speed and then I am comfortably going along. Well, what happens here in the first case is there is an interval of time between these lines here during this interval of time there is a mismatch right there is a vestibular mismatch. So, your brain has the opportunity to latch on to a mismatch over some period of time and it builds a lot of confidence right. You imagine the brain is going oh yes I am certain there is a mismatch it has been going on for a second or two right. Whereas, in this case there is a mismatch only at some tiny fraction of a second right. So, just a in, if you want to look at the limiting mathematical case then maybe it is only a single 0 length interval impulse right bam there is some mismatch. This the brain may rule as an outlier it may say ok there is always outliers in the data a kind of hiccup it is gone. So, this seems to be perceived as an outlier like what was that some big flash some huge mismatch probably junk discarded this one the brain is very certain and the brain is right you know there is some very consistent mismatch happening here. So, um, so this ends up being very uncomfortable a B ends up being the one that is more comfortable. Um, this is some of the re this is one of the reasons why you will see this as well in some of the apps where um, if you are rotating your character you may notice that some of them when you press the button it rotates a fixed number of degrees each time rather than smoothly rotating. Smoothly rotating is very nauseating, but jumping discreetly is not as bad, but if you jump discreetly 90 degrees each time then you are not even sure which way you are facing anymore. So, you have difficulty of being disoriented you are not really sure where you are facing anymore it would be great to just point and click where you would like to go and just be there. If we could do that in the real world it would not be so bad either right. So, so that is fine, but you also start to get confused about your um, um where you are in space. So, that is a trade off you have to deal with. So, we want to minimize this kind of discomfort due to this vestibular mismatch with your um visual cues, but at the same time we also want to make sure that you can that your spatial reasoning and awareness remains intact that is a challenge we face. If you can make progress on that for your class project I, I would be delighted you know so, it is a great great uh, challenge All right questions about that. Is there an upper limit to the constant velocity at which uh, friction does not appear? Um, you may be a, maybe a, a lower limit like if the mismatch is sort of small enough there is another limit which could be that maybe I make this slope so low that it and it is so gradual that um it may be comfortable right. So, so, so that limit could exist I am asking about the limit to the speed itself 
Yeah. The so, upper limit to the speed. So if I raise this up higher? Yeah. Will it cause? I think it, I think it will tend to be worse. But, um, <clears throat> there are interesting questions about going up to speeds that are familiar to us, right? Like we may be, if we believe we're in a car, we may be accustomed to going up to some speed and then remaining at that. And if we see stimulus, it's like a bunch of roads around that may be comfortable. If we are in a building and we go up to some speed that is quite outrageous, faster than we could run in the building, that may be uncomfortable. But maybe it does not correspond to anything that we have ever seen before. So, maybe it is in fact not uncomfortable. I, I do not know you know there is a lot of things going on here. There are a lot of prior cues our brain is basing its conclusions uh, the, 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 this, this kind of unhappiness that comes up because of the mismatch on a lot of prior information. So, that is why you know I, I wonder about um, when I showed you the Birdley uh, demonstration of the, the flying. Um, um, you go flying over virtual San Francisco for example, that does not correspond to an experience that we have ever had before in the real world. There is also a motion platform that is helping your vestibular cues, but there is a lot of vection going on here I think nevertheless. But um, that is not the same as the scenario like here where you are just doing ordinary everyday walking which your brain is quite familiar with and there is a very obvious mismatch. So, it may be helping it to be to be worse by doing things at exactly the same kinds of speeds that we are normally comfortable with. So, it is providing everything in perfect alignment except this one mismatch and the brain may have an easy time. If a lot of things are mixed up maybe it will not you know maybe it will not be a sickening I really do not know I would have to do the experiments on a case by case basis. Sir, there is another problem like in, in uh, virtual reality at least uh, like most of the points are discrete and uh, you cannot have a smooth speed increase. So, it will be like you are jumping from one point to other at various speeds. So, mm -hmm. that might cause uh, like point yeah. might be at one point or suddenly it is at another point. So yeah, very good. I, I think that is a very good point. In fact, that is going to lead into my next topic which is um, apparent motion. So, if you have something that is really if you have a sequence of images that are being generated by a digital system and you per, you know under what conditions do you perceive that as a continuous motion? Under what conditions does that feel like the real world? Do you perceive that like the real world? And so, so there is a nice sort of gradual entryway based on your question in, in into the next topic. Um, you know it is it, at fundamentally I, I do not really make too much of a distinction between continuous versus discrete if the discretization intervals are so small that it very closely approximates continuous way below any sensible levels that could be detected by the body then the two are essentially the same. The universe itself is a discrete or continuous well I think it is more discrete actually than continuous when you look at it carefully when you move beyond Newtonian mechanics and into quantum mechanics and things. So, so the discrete versus continuous itself is not a extremely important distinction in this context, but when it is discrete what exactly are the rates and are those perceptible and that ends up being very interesting.